The presidential race is heating up as RFK Jr. announces his running mate. I'm so proud to introduce to you the next vice president of the United States, Nicole Shanahan. Nicole Shanahan is an Oakland, California native and powerhouse in Silicon Valley who made her mark as a tech attorney and entrepreneur. Previously married to Google co-founder Sergey Brin, the two divorced in 2022. Shanahan has turned her attention to philanthropy, helping fund autism research, and is president of Bia Echo Foundation, which focuses on reproductive longevity and criminal justice reform. With only 10 percent of the vote so far, was this the right pick for the presidential hopeful? It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, Director of Data Science from Decision Desk HQ. Scott, as always, thanks so much for being with us. Nicole Shanahan wasn't a household name before this announcement. What do we know about RFK's decision to tap her as his running mate? Well, she wasn't a household name, so everyone who's following RFK now is Googling her, which is what, what his campaign's based on. It's based on buzz. That's why he did that buzzy um, Super Bowl ad that we talked about, and, and it sounds like she funded it. Um, it's going to create some buzz. I don't know anything about her, just like everyone else. I'm Googling like everyone else. I'm looking for the reports. It'll be interesting. You know, she she could certainly create some some excitement. Um, you know, obviously the Democratic and Republican um, Republicans are deriding her as inexperienced and things like that. But look, a third party candidate like RFK is not his his argument isn't bringing experience to the table. His argument's bringing new blood. And she's certainly that. So Kennedy and Shanahan are aligned on issues such as vaccine skepticism. Is there any data showing this being a no win opinion? Uh, you know, there, there's quite a bit on vaccine data over the last two or three years, because if you remember, this started with Chris Christie, um, you know, way back five, six, seven years ago um, in the in the GO, in his GOP primary when he was governor, where he came out interestingly against this. And then it's always been a thing in Republican primaries, GOP primaries, things like that as a fringe movement. So anywhere from five to 10 percent of GOP primary voters tend to have some skepticism around vaccines. Obviously, after COVID, there was quite a bit of backlash and discussion around that. And we see GOP voters anywhere from 5 to 10 percent have some issues around vaccines or at least some skepticism around it. Um, and so, you know, RFK is being a leading voice on that for longer than longer, for at least 10 or 15 years now. So he's got a name brand around that. Um, look, it's not a mainstream view. Um, you know, Pew did a great study last year where they showed 80% of Americans either somewhat or wholly trusted their uh, their primary care physicians on vaccines for themselves and their children, which is, you know, bipartisan support for vaccines. But there is a small subset out there um, that support it and they're fervent about it. And it looks like RFK is certainly going to tap into that. Nicole Shanahan seems like an interesting pick for RFK Jr. for sure, but it's clearly calculated. She's a political novice. Could this benefit the campaign by bringing in an outsider such as her? Yeah, look, last time we had something like this, John McCain picked Sarah Palin, right, a relative outsider. Now, she was governor of, uh, of Alaska, so she had some political experience, but he was looking for a game change, right? That was his term. Um this is what RFK is looking for. She's a new face. We're going to she's going to get a lot of interviews. She's going to get an opportunity to present herself um, on the campaign trail. Maybe she maybe she wows and impresses. Maybe she doesn't. Um, this is a good pick just because we're all asking questions. We want to hear her and hear what she has to say. She also brings a lot of funding to the table, which is something RFK is going to need. Um, you know, today it looks like a good pick. Let's see what it looks like a week or two down the road um, when she's on the trail. Yeah, and on that question about the funding that she could bring to you know the campaign, it's important to note she previously donated four million dollars to the Super PAC that ran the pro Kennedy Super Bowl ad. Do you think this decision was primarily motivated by her money? Well, I don't know if it was primarily motivated, but we'd be foolish to think it wasn't part of the calculation, right? Like all campaigns at the end of the day, they need money and they need money to operate. So you have to believe that you know. At some point, there was a discussion about would she be willing to put funds in or at least hit up some of her her uh, her donor friends to, to help do this. I mean, look, let's just be honest. He's certainly not going to come out and say it, but it, it had to have been at least a factor in his decision making. So what are the next steps they need to take for a chance to you know, make some sort of an impact on the presidential race? Well, I found it interesting. You know, we were, I was watching his uh, his announcement speech the other day, and he actually came out and he said the quiet part out loud. He's like, my campaign's a spoiler. Right yeah. now, he was saying in the context of 
he thinks he's going to spoil and win the whole thing. I think that's highly improbable. Um, but what his campaign needs to do is they need to get on ballots in places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, Georgia, and really all 50 states if they're going to win enough electoral votes. Um, but that's what we're looking for. He he is his his, his uh, aligned super PAC, which he can't coordinate with, has said that they have enough um, signatures in places like Georgia and Arizona. So that shows some organizational heft. Um, they're obviously raising money. He talks about it as if he knows what he needs to do. Um, so, you know, that's part of the battle. We'll see, you know, as we get Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, their, their filing deadlines and their signature deadlines over the next few months. If his campaign does that, um, you know, they're, they're positioning themselves to at least have a significant role in what and who gets to be president this this, you know, later this year, even if it's not themselves. So talking to Republicans and Democrats um, supporting Trump and Biden, you know, none of them seem to be thrilled about the idea of an RFK candidacy because of the fact that he could be a spoiler. So but we don't know really who he's going to impact the GOP or the Democratic side. So what's Decision Desk's three way tracker showing between Biden, Trump and RFK Jr.? So it's right before I was on here, we were, we were playing around with that. Nationally, um, we've got RFK at just right around 9%, which is about a point lower than, he, than his high watermark reached a week ago. We're working on some of these averages in battleground states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin. So, we're, you know, look for those to be released in the coming week or two as we get more polling data on it. I will say at least nationally, he takes away from both Democrats and Republicans. Um, it's not significant. It's one or two points. Um, uh, nationally, and it's certainly not going to not going to flip the race for him. But if he actually takes one or two points away from both the Republican and Democrat, both Biden and Trump in a state like Wisconsin or a state like Pennsylvania or Georgia or Michigan, he will certainly play a deciding factor. And, and at least right now, there's a long way to go in the campaign. He takes voters from both sides. Making everyone on all sides very nervous, that's for sure. So switching gears to President Biden, is Decision Desk following any good news for him regarding his approval rating? You know, it's interesting on that, too. I was looking at it. He is back down right before the State of the Union. He was in 39 percent approval rating, which is one of his lowest marks over the last year. He did the State of the Union. His numbers came out of the State of the Union relatively flat. They actually hit a new six month high watermark a week ago today. He was in the, it was a low 44. Today, he's back down to 40 percent. And so what I would like to say is, look, he had a little bit of bump after the State of the Union running around, and now it's uh, you know come back down to where where he's been primarily over the last year, somewhere between 39 and 42. What I will say for those of us who watch this, this is how it goes. He's going to go up and down, and I look where his range is. His range has been 39 to 44 the last six months. Um, we need to see his range move up to 44 to 48. That's what his campaign would like him to see as he um, you know gets into the campaign season. But right now, his range 39 to 44. Uh, you know, his campaign's gearing up. He's about to spend money. He's certainly going out there. He had a he had a strong speech after the the bridge collapse in in Maryland the other day. Um, he's going to have to get out there and see if he can move his range up. But as of today, it's roughly where it was right before the State of the Union. So moving on to individual states, President Biden won Georgia by only 11,779 votes uh, in 2020. But recent polling shows Trump is expanding his lead in the state. Could Georgia ultimately decide the election this year? Uh, it could. Actually, Georgia is one of those states where obviously Trump, you know, famously tried very hard to find a, a few 11,000 extra votes. <laughs> um, his campaign spending a lot of money down there. I don't necessarily think it's going to be the deciding state as long as Trump wins it. If he doesn't win it and Biden actually pulls it off there, that that could 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 be the tipping point state. But I'm looking at states like Michigan, Arizona um, to be tipping point states. Um, Georgia certainly a battleground, but the polling looks really good for Donald Trump there. And, you know, before 2020, that was a solid Republican state. And so we expect that one to go back in the column, although the, the Biden campaign says they're going to compete there. They also say they're going to compete in North Carolina, which was a solid Trump state in 2020 and 2016. You know, it wasn't it hasn't been won by a Democrat since 2008. So certainly there's going to be some battles um, back and forth. Yeah, North Carolina really is a, emerging as one of the most talked about swing states this cycle. But I want to move further out west. Um, it seems like Biden might be in hot water when it comes to Arizona and Nevada this election after winning both states in 2020. What are those states looking like right now? Would Trump win in those states if the election was held today? Short answer, yes. If we look at the polling averages in Nevada and Arizona, he is, you know, anywhere from one to three points up. You know, that's not 100 percent. If I had a thousand dollars to bet, I wouldn't bet all a thousand dollars on Donald Trump, but I'd certainly be betting on him to win. 
Um, let's let's talk about in Nevada for a second. Nevada, there is a contentious Senate race. You know, we have incumbent Democratic Senator Jackie Rosen there. Um, she's expected to win. But we have been seeing in the polling, Donald Trump has been doing better with Hispanic, especially blue collar Hispanic workers, which Nevada has a lot of. Um, you know, we could see a scenario where the Democrats against all odds hold, hold on to a Senate seat in Ohio or maybe a Senate seat in Montana, but lose their Senate seat in Nevada. And Donald Trump wins a state like that um, uh, and, and wins the presidency as well as, you know, clinches the Senate based off that. So Nevada is one of my dark horse states. I know we're going to talk about Georgia, Michigan, um, Pennsylvania a lot, but but states like um, Nevada and Arizona, especially given how Trump is performing among the Hispanic voters, um, is, is certainly one to watch. Scott, before I let you go, I want to get your take on this week's special election in Alabama. It was a bright spot for Democrats, particularly on the issue of reproductive rights. Do you think the special election is a warning sign for Republicans across the country going into the general election this fall? Short answer is yes. I mean, look, it is a it was a district that was R plus one. So on paper, if everything goes supposed to how it's supposed to, the Republican should have won. Now, the Democrat who, who actually won last night uh, obviously overperformed her, her numbers there, but she very explicitly campaigned on reproductive rights, right? So she put it out there in deep red Alabama and said, this is why you need to vote for me. So it was a, it was a very good for us political scientists, a test case to see how that messaging works in an environment that's not necessarily friendly to it. I think that playbook is going to be looked at in places like Ohio and Michigan and, and some of these other places where we might see some reproductive rights um, bills on the table. And, and again, this is this is not a one off data point. We saw this in Ohio last year um, on some of the ballot issues we're seeing and some other stuff. So th this is this is something both Democrats and Republicans could watch because this is a repeatable playbook. Scott Tranter, as always, thank you for helping us break it down this week. Ah, thanks for having me. Battleground states will play a determining factor in this election. How many are there and why are they so key? The Hill staff writer Rafael Bernal has all of the answers. So strap yourself in and get ready for a wild election year. The 2024 presidential election is going to come down to seven states. In every other state, barring major surprises, voters will pick the same party and the same candidate they picked in 2020. So if you live in any of these states, grab your popcorn. It's still important to vote for a number of reasons, including down ballot races and just to show whoever wins that you're still there. But why do these seven states, specifically these seven, get to choose our next president? A straw poll of our newsroom came up with a nearly unanimous answer. That's an interesting question. But in a nutshell, a swing state is one that either party could win. That doesn't mean just a state that was close. President Biden came within single digits of beating former President Trump in five states that went red. Of those, North Carolina is the only one that's widely accepted to be a swing state. Trump lost by less than 10 percentage points in nine states, in Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin by less than one percentage point. So the closest states are the swing states, but there's different reasons how they got so competitive. Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin were part of Hillary Clinton's 2016 blue wall that came crumbling down. They were traditionally democratic states. Blue collar union workers and diverse urban populations were the democratic base. A lot of those industrial jobs left, and a lot of those blue collar workers were receptive to Trump's pitch. But in Pennsylvania's case, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia kept big Democratic constituencies balancing out the total. In Michigan, Detroit's not the urban powerhouse it used to be, but it has a diverse population that was not as receptive to Trump's pitch. But that doesn't mean they always go blue. About 100,000 voters in Michigan, led by the state's big Arab American population, voted uncommitted in the Democratic primary this year to protest Biden's Gaza policies. That union vote is still a big deal in Nevada, where workers in the state's huge tourism industry have recently favored Democratic candidates. Demographics play a huge role, too. Many of those unionized Nevadans are also Latinos with deep connections to the immigrant community. In Arizona, demographic change is the name of the game. Phoenix has grown to become the country's fifth largest city, and it's full of young voters, many of them Hispanic, who tend to vote for Democrats. 
But both these states have big rural and suburban populations who themselves range from the swingy to the deep red. In Georgia and North Carolina, growing urban areas and substantial black populations have helped the Democrats make inroads. But the last time Democrats won North Carolina was 2008, and while Biden won Georgia by a smidge in 2020, Democrats had not taken that state since 1992. And that's the point with swing states. They keep changing. As recently as 2008, the saying went, as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. And trust me, no one is betting on Biden to take Ohio. There could be a new swing state hiding in the data, just like Georgia was in 2020. But there's usually years of work by a party behind those shifts. That's why North Carolina is on the radar this year. And even a few Democrats say Texas should be. One thing we do know about swing states right now the polls say Trump is currently leading in all of them. That's it for What's America Thinking. Come back next week and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hills YouTube channel. And we want to hear from you. Leave your comments and let us know what's on your mind.